Go. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our 29th Open Clock Club, which is um, a product of uh, our little brand called How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. And the primary purpose of these events is to support people who read and bought our book, which is up there. I forgot to turn my fairy lights on. Might do, do those a bit later on, but anyway. Uh, the sun's shining here in York. Hope it is wherever you are. And um, yeah, it uh, feels like kind of high summer now. Well, getting on that way anyway. The uh, shortest, long, shortest night, longest day in a couple of weeks. So look forward to that. Um, anyhow, as always, um, the, uh, these sessions are recorded and they go on our archive channel. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your camera turned off. Um, but otherwise, we are joined, uh, thankfully, by Team Open Clock Club over here in the corner, who is conducting the live chat. So please say hello on the live chat and ask any questions. Uh, in fact, we're going to start with a question from last week. We don't always get round to answering the questions during the sessions, um, but we've got our Facebook page, remember, which passed 500 uh, members this week. So that's pretty awesome. So thank you again, everybody who um, contributes to that. And um, yeah, uh, usual thing. The weeks just blur one, one week into the other. <laughs> so total chaos, really. Um, Oh, and uh, apologies if, if anybody is expecting our um, York uh, Festival of Ideas week. Everybody's going, yes, we are, Matthew, because you said last week it would be on this week. Well, it's not, I'm afraid. It's next week. I'd got my dates muddled up. So um, apologies, department is now closed, I'm afraid. Uh, so <laughs> no, no point in apologizing. But anyway, if you are here as a complete beginner because of the York Festival of Ideas, then thank you so much. Please, um, oh, there we, we've got one person there. I'm really, really sorry about that. I said last week, bring beginners uh, this week. We um, stream every week at the same time, but it's actually the 18th or 19th, I think, when we're doing our actual festival of ideas, one where we'll be starting right from the beginning. So I'm really sorry, real apologies if you've um, made all sorts of arrangements to be here tonight. Anyway, hopefully if you're interested in repairing clocks, you will stick around and uh, you will uh, learn something. Anyway, ask questions please on the live chat. So maybe the live chat also needs to apologize for those people who have rearranged their whole lives to be here when it's actually next week. Um, so yeah, we're doing an hour and a half next week, and we ask we had to ask our panel, our members, a question, and um, what are those questions that absolute beginners ask? And of course, one of those things is I've got uh, you know something I've heard a lot is I've got no practical experience really. Maybe did something in school. Uh, it's not been the kind of thing I've been involved with. Been working. Is it realistic that I can become a clock repairer? And the answer is yes. Uh, of course, it's not quite as simple as that. We we had somebody on the Facebook group this week who was a novice who bought this enormous kind of spring wound uh, clocking in clock. I don't know whether you saw that, but that is frankly, as much as I want to be encouraging, it's really not the place to begin. Um, those things are driven by enormous springs. They can cause damage to the mechanism, but also importantly, damage to you as well when you're disassembling them. So we wrote our book uh, across there, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, based around um, a Smith's Enfield mantle clock. So that's a clock with one uh, timepiece train only. We call it the train. So not striking, not chiming, just telling the time only. So effectively, the simplest mechanical clock you can get your hands on. And the great thing is, uh, you can buy them on the internet auction sites. They're not massively expensive and, um, and you can get started. And also next week, we're going to show you how to work around those critical questions. Where should I begin? What tools do I need? How do I clean a clock? How do I oil it? How do I actually get it going? So we will uh, cover all that stuff and hopefully get some people started. So anyway, long-winded and apologetic uh, introduction there, just to say, 
Um, we are here primarily to support our beginners, um, but of course we get great questions from our audience, some of which are kind of quite tangential, so we go off on a little tangent, and then we come back. And we've got a couple of um, ongoing projects. So we deal with clocks, really, uh, all pendulum clocks, don't deal with carriage clocks or watches. Um, so, and there's a good reason for that is because typically the scale of those things is kind of quite good for beginners and they're quite uh, numerous as well. Um, but there's a heck of a range within that from our Smith's Enfield clock, which is made in the middle of the 20th century. And we've got members who have got clock collections and they go right back to the 17th century. I think we've, that's probably the earliest clock that we've seen so far, but no doubt there's somebody there with 16th century um, clocks. I'm looking at Chris and Ian there, but they're, their remaining stone where they've got those really old clocks. Anyhow, um, so we had a question last week about the hands of a clock, and it's a really great question. And I think it actually related to uh, hands that are made out of bone. Um, the hands like this, this is a 30 hour duration uh, English, probably uh, tall case clock. And the hand is made out of iron or steel. But on something like a cuckoo clock or a German clock, um, I don't know about American clocks, whether the hands are made, is, if Devashish is with us, he'll be able to tell us what clock that was from. Um, but the hand is made out of uh, bone. And of course, there are lots of clocks where the hands are made out of plastic as well. So it's kind of quite interesting. And it's a bigger question about a repair. You know, we there's one thing, and I would strongly advise a beginner to start with a clock that needs zero repairs, because there's obviously part of that process of going from novice to expert or going up the hierarchy of expertise um, is that you really don't want to start with something that's a bit of a train smash, because um, we want to encourage people, we want them to get through at least their first project without having to repair anything, taking a clock apart safely, cleaning it, putting it back together, oiling it, getting it ticking is probably enough for a first project. However, when you have done that, and I'm sure I don't know if Jane's with us this afternoon, uh, yes, she is, yeah. But I think Jane was one of our members who started with uh, the book and a Smith's clock, and then now is carrying on all kinds of crazy and interesting repairs within a few months, actually. So I made really amazing progress. But one of those kind of common repairs is this problem. It's not only relating to hands, but it relates to um, anything where there's a square. I don't know if you can see here, but there's a, a square filed on the end of this cylindrical component here, if you can see that. And then there's a corresponding square hole in the middle of the hand. And this is absolutely typical. Once the um, interference fit or the fit between the two squares begins to wear, they just get much, much worse kind of quite rapidly. They never heal up. Unfortunately, clocks are not um, self-healing. Let's take that spring off there. Um, in this case, and in uh, we've, we've got a kind of um, a slightly polarized situation because the clocks that we would advise you uh, begin on um, are machine made clocks. And so the components there tend to be like, if you imagine a shaft with a bearing, that thing is parallel. Okay, like it would be inside a car or a modern, any modern bit of machinery. And that's because the technology, the sort of um, post uh, industrial revolution technology and clocks, of course, and guns, were one of the first things where we have interchangeable parts and so on. You have parallel parts that can be made to be interchangeable. Now, as you develop in your practice, and we hope you do develop, you'll start to work maybe on clocks like this that are pre-industrial revolution effectively. So these, although they're made in manufacturers, no, they're not kind of like individually handmade, they're actually got tapered components. And if you can see there, that, um, shaft that goes between the hand and this wheel is not parallel at all. And there's a very, very good reason for that, because if you don't have that modern machinery, it's like nearly impossible to make two parallel things that fit together. So what clockmakers have done for hundreds of years is they've made tapered components. 
And what that means is you can slowly, slowly, slowly increase the diameter of something until it's a really good fit. Somebody once asked me, you know, in the Georgian period, the instruments were made for George III, how on earth did they get those to be so beautifully kind of uh, fitted together, like ahead of the time? And the answer is that they use tapered bearings or tapered mating surfaces. But so that's um, kind of what happened with this hand here. The square two um, is very slightly tapered. So you start to put the hand on. I just move it around to the camera there. And you can see it doesn't want to go on in that direction. It will only go in one place. There we are. It goes on like that. But eventually, with setting the clock and moving the hand like this, this square wears. And particularly in the case of the hand that was in the question, where it's made out of bone or plastic or ivory or wood, what do you do about that? Well, there is no wrong or right way to repair a clock. And I reinforce this the whole time uh, through the Facebook group, because we get a lot of people who say you've got to do this, must do that, should do this. I'm a, as controversial as it sounds, I'm not a supporter of that because I sense that the minute you say you've got to do this, got to do that, then you stop the learning process. You know, you put barriers up to learning. So what normally happens with these iron hands, and if you can see here, yeah, you can just catch it in the light there, is if you look around the hand square, it's been punched. So somebody's taken a metal punch, a bit like a nail or something, and, um, and they've punched that to squidge across or to um, plastically deform the material. Now, that's a super quick fix, and it probably is going to be OK for decades, if not longer. But the problem with that kind of repair, anything where you're deforming material, is you can't do it time after time after time, because obviously that material eventually just gets thinner and thinner and more and more damaged. Um, and also what we've, we've got a double kind of whammy here because where you've got this iron hand, the, um, the square is wearing as well. So both components are wearing together. So what do you do then? Well, what I would do with this iron hand, and again, in the live chat, if you don't mind telling me what you do, I'll do, um, is I would, it's almost, unheard of, I think, on these 18th century clocks, that you find a component like this that hasn't been punched or hammered or something like that. So when it gets to the stage where the material's getting thin and it's quite sort of um, chewed up with repairs, then what I would say was to do effectively uh, a bushing operation on this. Um, so where we have uh, the bearings of a clock, like the main, uh, the, the bearings, the main axles, they too wear, and ultimately that wear leads to more friction within the mechanism between the meshing of the gears. And we have to do something called a bushing, which is replacing one element of the, of the bearing. And I do a similar thing here. Um, you know, you kind of have to make that, well, no have to, but if you want to maintain this clock in working order and you don't want the hand to slop about, I would, um, uh, either file away some material from the square and solder in a piece of brass um, or in fact rivet in a bigger piece of brass and make a new hole. Not iron, I would do it in brass and then it can be done time after time after time uh, uh, with that. Now we've got another example here which is the same uh, thing. This is part of the striking mechanism from an 18th century clock. Uh, but it's exactly the same problem. We've got a square, you can see there, filed on the end. And we've got a component called the gathering pallet, um, which is, oh, you can't actually see the hole through it because somebody's filled it with solder. Um, and those two things fit together. And again, you can see, look, it's gotten very loose over, um, over the period at which it's been running. So we, again, uh, intervene if we want to keep this thing in working order. Of course, you can make a new component, but what I'm going to do again here is to solder um, this, this component where it's broken and try and make a new square inside there. Again, that operation may not be successful. I think quite understandably, and particularly for uh, people who are beginning, they hope, and I totally get why, that there's some 
definitive answer to fixing these things. And you could say, yes, this is the way, of course, we've between our lovely group that I see here, we've got a lot of experience, hundreds, if not thousands of years experience, certainly hundreds of years experience. And in fact, be, that would actually be really cool to add that up one day. Um, but nevertheless, when you develop your practice, the key thing, we've been talking about this in the Facebook group this week, we had a question about uh, a broken component from a 19th century or 18th century clock, I think. And this is, don't matter whether you're a beginner or whether you've been doing this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there's always that decision making process. And that process is called, I call it practice. So we go from learning by rote, by take this thing apart, move this, which is what our book says basically, to decision making. And that decision making is really incredibly painful because when you begin to do it, like learning anything, it makes smoke come out of your ears um, and it's really tough, but it kind of gets easier with, with time. And we, um, we all find our own place in this craft we call horology and nobody's line is in the same place. And what I think is really important in terms of continual learning is that that line uh, moves the whole time. You know, the decisions that we make today won't be the decision we'll make tomorrow. And it certainly won't be the decision we make in five years time because something crops up. And that is a killer thing with old objects. I don't know how many of you watch in the, in the UK, there's a really popular, um, program called the repair shop which uh, is kind of like bringing treasures back to life and stories and all that stuff it's really cool popular program and that is based on uh, these a group of experts including a clocks person um who who repairs uh repairs things and of course they've got decades and decades of experience so you don't see the pain but what you do sometimes see is well, we've got options here. So we've always got options when we're doing these things. And this may go down like the proverbial lead balloon, but with um, Devashish's bone hand, I wonder about using, oh, upside down. I wonder about using this uh, material. Um, it's an epoxy resin. Uh, this is just the um, cheap one, of course, being a Yorkshireman. Um, I don't think that's actually it. I think it's a bit of aldehyde on there. But it's uh, like most epoxies, it's a two-part thing. It's like putty. It's kind of like a clay modeling putty thing. And I wonder whether you could fill in the uh, square in your hand where it's got worn on the corners and then uh, file to size, uh, slowly open up that square. Um, I've got no problem at all with using modern materials like this. Um, you know, one of our favorite, um, one of my favorite uh, things is the old um, Loctite uh, 2701. And we can't go one session without talking about the old uh, Bo Swan automaton, which I more and more glued together with that stuff uh, to keep the thing on the road. So there we are. So hopefully that helps. No um, definitive answer for you, I'm afraid, uh, Devashish. Just before we move on to something else, this is the hand from the Smith's Enfield clock. So if you are a beginner joining us this evening, then this is the first component that you will need to remove from your clock. And you can see um, this uh, axle here, which we clocks people call an arbor, runs through the middle of the clock. So you normally look at it like this, and the minute hand fits on a little square there at the front. So that's your first challenge is to get the, the hand off. You can see it's actually pinned through there with a little cross pin, which we will talk about next week. So again, still squirming from uh, getting my dates mixed up. This kind of hand's kind of straight, more straightforward because it's, I don't know, is it better engineered than the 18th century one? Probably. It's quite thin um, material. You can see it's quite bendy. I think it might even be aluminium. I don't know. But they fitted it with a brass boss. It's painted black, so you can't see it's brass. But what you can see is it's quite thick. In fact, it's probably thicker. Yeah, it is. It's thicker than the 18th century 30-hour uh, clock hand. That's not always the case. But that means that this component 
um, is uh, lo a lot less likely to wear and cause you problems. Nevertheless, there is still about the equivalent of probably 30 seconds of time of wear in there. So I know what we would do. We would um, gently hammer this down to close that square up if it begins to wear. But again, that often has knock on um, uh, problems. I think, I can't remember who it was this week, was talking about knock on problems with, um, uh, with clock repairing. You know, the minute you start to bend or file or change something, then particularly with striking work, it has one issue which knocks on a domino effect, if you like, to the next thing and causes um, causes a problem. Right. So hopefully that's covered that. Be interesting to know. Uh, are we getting any feedback on the bone stroke, ivory stroke, wooden hands? Well, it, it was an 1820 cuckoo clock. Right. With a wooden plated movement. Yeah. Twin fusee. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, Devaji said he would put an insert. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I think um, that's fine. So then um, I think we're going to go with an insert for this hand from this early nineteenth century cuckoo clock. Um, just be super cautious that if there's anything that's kind of riveted, that it doesn't split the hand open because of course that material has got a kind of grain like wood. Um, so, as always, uh, try and find a bit of material to do some practicing on, on first. Right, um, back to our little ongoing project. And again, just um, because we've joined by uh, our beginners this week, so we um, I will we'll try and bring you into the, uh, into the conversation as much as we can, because we're very glad that you're here. Um, when we suggest you start, we suggest, as I said, you start with a clock that's only got uh, the going train, the time, the time train, um, because of course that's the simplest way to go from A to Z in clock repair. But once you've done that, and I think people would uh, uh, agree here, I don't know where Jane is, if she's, if she's around. Um, but the next step is to get a very similar mid 20th century clock again, because they're reasonably plentiful and they've got interchangeable parts. So if something goes terribly wrong, you can always borrow the parts from other clocks. And this time to get a clock that's got two sets of gears. So it's got a, a going train, so it shows the time and it's got a striking train as well. So it'll strike typically the hours and the half hours as well as this one does here. Um, just get my pointy stick. So what we've got, I must make sure I've got this the right way around. So uh, usual thing are parts everywhere. So what we've got here is the, um, the motive force for our clock. It's the same thing, whether it's a single train or a two train, we've got what we call a barrel. Now this is the, for the beginner, this is the most difficult thing to deal with because there's um, a risk to taking the clock apart because of the mainspring. The mainspring, you can just about see it now. I'll give it a poke to wake it up. Anyway, it was sleeping, but it's awake now. That and um, and the problem with the mainspring is that you really need, and we're going to talk about tools a lot next week. If you want to get the spring out of that barrel, then again, there are. Uh, opinions vary, but you need specialist tools to do it. So what we would say for the beginner is that we make reasonable adjustments so you can clean the clock and leave the spring in the barrel. Maybe not regarded by some as good practice or certainly not best practice for uh, a sort of professional repairer. However, for the beginner, as a confidence building exercise, we're going to leave the spring in the barrel. But that's not our problem today. Um, so here's our clock plate. Uh, this is the kind of chassis or the frame of the clock. And I mean, you can see here, but uh, there's a hole there and then a series of bearings as we go up the plate. One, two, three, four. And that's where the time side of the clock lives. Uh, the gears that drive the hands around, basically. And you can see here on this side, we've got one, two, three, four, five. Or, in fact, more than that, we've got one, two, three, four, five, or something like that, maybe six, I don't know, I've lost count. Um, gears from the gearbox or the train of the striking side. And what happened here was the little click spring 
So the mechanism, you know, when you wind a clock and you can hear it going click, 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 it's this uh, spring that's causing that clicking sound has broken. So we had a question again, I think it was through Facebook group, I can't remember now. Um, what do you do when this spring breaks? Because these 20th century clocks and earlier clocks as well, were not designed per se to be taken apart and repaired. So you will get to a point where you have to start making things. And again, this is all part of developing practice. I'll just get some tweezers. Um, wants you to know that for the bone hands, yeah, would be surgeon's bone cement, not an insert, insert cement hand bone. All right, okay, all right. So there's a thing called surgeon's bone cement, which makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, maybe there's something as well that dentists use uh, for the. Oh, that's nice. We we need to Google that and put it on there. Um, put a link, please. That, that sounds like the kind of product that everybody needs in their workshop, surgeon's bone cement, just in case. We live near quite um, a busy level crossing here, a sort of a zebra crossing. So um, it's, it, it's only a question of time before I'm gonna need that um, surgeon's bone cement. Anyway, uh, so the question is, um, when you've got a component like this, when you move on from your first clock and you find your first thing that's broken, and needs either repairing or replacing, what do you do? Well, the answer is that for most clocks, or the more modern ones anyway, you can actually buy components. And um, so this spring, uh, I think again, it was Jane was talking about the springs last week. Can you buy these? And if you can, are they any good? And I think the answer was, yes, you can uh, spring steel, but, you can also make one as well. So that's what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. We made a replacement spring here from a piece of brass sheet, which kind of looks a bit complicated now, but it just started life as a piece of brass. We filed it, we drilled it, we sawed it. All really useful skills. And again, you know, trying to encourage uh, those people who are maybe thinking about getting into clock repairing, the beauty of building these skills is not necessarily that you can repair clocks, but the world looks like a totally different place. Um, so whether you're doing things around the house, thinking about how things are made and developed, uh, you all of a sudden say, oh, I can fix that. You know, that kind of right to repair type um, sort of attitude, which I think is one of the biggest joys of learning how to fix clocks. It's not fixing clocks per se but it's actually the fact that you can fix other things as well. And of course you end up with a queue of, um, of glorious jobs to do around the house. It was the um, rather uh, not very romantic lavatory system this week, but um, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Anyway, um, so just demonstrate. So we made this, little spring here last week out of oh, not last week it's taken ages two or three weeks and um bit of adjustment and now we get to the stage where excuse fingers also last week i was trying to demonstrate how to set a clocky beat so thank you chris for your explanation of why that was almost impossible over the internet um, so we live in it and I will do a video on it, but I wasn't helping myself because I had my super expensive microphone turned off as well. So it was coming to the computer anyway. Um, it'd be actually quite interesting to see if you can hear it clicking. Yeah, so it would have helped if I had the microphone turned on. So um, lots of kind of uh, practice questions here about do you um, improve something? You know, if you uh, can make things and repair things and you come across a design that you think is lacking, do you improve that thing? Um, I mean, my kind of baseline on that is no, um, I'm not really here to do that. If I wanna do that, I'll try and make a completely new clock. And again, for beginners who've joined us, if somewhere in the back of your mind or even in the front of your mind, could I ever make a clock? Then the answer is yes. Uh, you can make it completely from scratch. It's quite a long way down the road probably, but it is 
uh, possible. You start by making components for repairs, and then one day you make the leap. But that's another story, but that's a possibility and something we get asked quite a lot. So um, do you improve something? Well, in this case, there's a safety issue because this spring, as I said before, holds back all the power from the main spring. And if it fails, then it can damage the clock, but importantly, it can damage the fingers of the person that's winding it. So we don't want that to happen. So what I've done is I've actually made the spring a little bit shorter uh, than it was before to press uh, on the click on this component here, slightly closer to the rivet than it did when it was new. And what that means, as you can see, is there's a nice kind of light flicking action. So I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the one thing I would point out here is that the original spring was steel. Again, beginners will notice straight away that clocks are made out of steel and brass. And there's a really good reason for the fact that they're not made out of all steel or all brass. And that's because of friction. Steel and brass together have got a relatively good or low coefficient of friction. So you normally get steel bearings, uh, steel and brass bearings working together. Now, what I've done here is I've now got a piece of brass, a piece of brass and a piece of brass working together. So it's kind of not ideal in that respect, but I think otherwise, um, this, is, this is a good repair. Uh, well, we'll find out in a minute when I've actually finished it. So we're really nearly there. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, we talk a lot about the manipulation of materials. So in this series, we'll talk about it next week a little bit as well. Again, really useful. We've done things like hardening and tempering uh, steel, which sounds like something from outer space, but you can do with relatively, relatively simple tools. And here, you see this piece of brass, which was soft. We hardened it, and it's now springy. Uh, so we work hardened it. We just did that by hammering. So you can manipulate materials to do what you want. Now, our rivet, which wants cutting off now, um, is drawn wire. So it's kind of relatively hard. It's a, it's a funny material, but it's quite sticky wire when you, when you turn it. So I'm going to cut it off, and then I'm going to anneal it. Probably doesn't need to be done, but as a demonstration, um, as one of those things that you can buy, or as you, as you start, you start with very few tools, hand tools, and then begin to build a workshop to do things like soldering. We kind of do soldering nearly every week, it seems, at the moment. Um, and every, everybody loves it, because I usually set fire to uh, something, my jacket, back of my, back of my hand last week on Thursday. So it's, it's a good laugh. Um, all right, I need to cut it down first, actually. So we'll, we'll come back to heating in a minute. Um, but that piece of brass is remarkably easy to manipulate to get it to do what you want it to do. And again, talking about... Um, let's just budge that up there a bit. Like that. So talking about um, tools and things like that, uh, those beginners that have joined us this week are going to go, right, okay, so what's happening now? We, we've got a lathe, a watchmaker's lathe, this thing is, looks complicated, looks really expensive. Please don't be put off by seeing uh, this stuff. This is not necess necessarily, this is not necessary, should I say, to completely get you started. I'll just see if I can get my camera to do its thing in focus in a different place. Uh, maybe it's just out, out of range of the lens. Let's just get right in the corner there. Probably is, poor thing. Ask it to do a lot. Anyway, I'm just gonna cut this little rivet off. Don't actually need the lathe for this. I'm just um, using it to pull the rivet. I'm using a jeweler saw. Now a jeweler saw or a piercing saw, um, you can see, is one of those things that I would say is one of your first purchases as a beginner. And again, uh, primarily because you can just use it for all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, the kinds of people who are interested in 
clock repair are often interested in making things, maybe making jewelry. Um, I, weave, I even repaired the sort of food blender thing using my piercing saw the other day, which was all slightly dodgy. Um, but again, you once you've got these few hand tools and materials, it's incredible how differently uh, I think you see the world. So I just, ooh, my finger's in the right place, just sawn off that rivet. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn it round and um, just tidy up the end. Then we're going to rivet it on the plate. And that's really a question. Um, it's nice, always nice to have a vote on this, uh, this channel. So originally, um, talking about improving things, originally this component was riveted on. The manufacturer either didn't think or they didn't bother designing it or it was cheapest uh, about replacement of parts as people go along. So um, do we re-rivet it or do we actually screw it in place so it can be taken off again? Or do we uh, tap the plate, so put a thread into the plate and fit a screw so it can be removed for cleaning and so on. So there's kind of um, advantages to all those, uh, those three things. The riveting is permanent, it's strong, it's cheap. You don't need um, any tool, specialist tools for making a thread. You could put a screw and a nut on there. Uh, here in York, we've got an excellent DIY shop right across the road. So we could pop across there and um, buy a, a screw and a nut and do it that way. So what, what are thoughts then, Rachel? So what are your thoughts in the live chat? Would you rivet it back on? Would you use a BA screw and a nut? Or would you um, tap the plate and put a screw in there in a kind of proper sort of so-called proper clocky way? So the options are one, a rivet it on, as I'm going to do. Two, use a BA screw, a machine screw and a nut and a washer. Or three, um, tap the plate. So put a thread into the plate and use the screw so you can take it on and off. So I'm just going to uh, file the head of this um, piece of metal flat. Um, our file here has got what they call a safe edge. Got some videos on our other channel about uh, this kind of stuff as well. Actually, left it a bit too chunky, but there you go. He said he'd be a bit wary about screwing in a click spring um, in case it works loose and has dangerous consequences. Mm. It's a it's a good point, um, Chris, uh, about um, those because on French clocks, of course, uh, they, uh, they the the blued steel screw for the click often does come undone. In fact, I think I always now put Loctite on those uh, medium strength uh, Loctite when I I do those clocks now. So just using a screw uh, into a tool would be perfect, if not riveting. Right. So, so riveting on seems more popular. Right. Okay. Well, as always, we've got a, a nice, uh, healthy range of uh, options, and that's my total point about this stuff: is that if you know, it's difficult being a human being to um, maintain any objectivity, of course. Apart from about my um, parallel action pliers, which are definitely one of my go-to tools, which we'll be talking about next week, honestly. And um, yeah, objectivity is a difficult thing, isn't it? But it is really nice. Uh, the, the sort of challenge with this, I find, uh, and again, if you follow the Facebook group, um, we had this question about whether you make something or whether you repair something. And of course, the challenge is you really don't know until you've done it. So you have to go through that process. And then often the material uh, sort of presents itself and you think, yeah, that was the obvious thing to do. But you can only see it uh, with the benefit of um, with the benefit of hindsight. So I'm going to uh, fix it on. Now, we've got a double challenge here because the uh, this component, which is a bit that does the clicking called the click, uh, is also riveted in place. So not ideal for cleaning, 
Um, and uh, certainly not ideal for putting this component on either because it's going to be in the way, inevitably. Right. So that's ultimately what we want. Okay. I've left it a bit high, but anyway. And I've left on the inside, if you can see there, about half a millimeter, something like that, um, to rivet over. Now, again, for beginners, when you think about how, when you first start doing this and you think half a millimeter, that sounds like, you know, I need some specialist measuring equipment to do that. You don't. It's amazing how quickly, you know, you'll be good, you get used to the scale of things. And when you start working on smaller, finer clocks, like French clocks with bearings that are half a millimeter, 0.4 of a millimeter, 0.3 of a millimeter, you kind of get into the zone uh, with all that stuff. Uh, with sort of familiarity. Right, 41. So I I would normally just rivet that on, but for sake of uh, some kind of educational thing, we're going to just anneal it. So to anneal brass, that's to make it softer when it's been hardened. Um, brass, as you can see the thing there, uh, brass is um, hardened by working it, brasses and bronzes and so on, and I think aluminium as well. Um, and so if you want to change the properties, you either hammer it or roll it or draw it or something like that. And this has been drawn when it was made. So I'm just going to use, uh, don't really like this thing, uh, I'm going to upgrade, but little sort of crumb brulee type torch. Because, oh, there it is lit really pretty terrible device. Now I'm just going to heat up that bit of brass if the torch actually decides to. It's Christmas soon. I'm just going to heat it until it's a dull red. If you've ever seen a silversmith working or ever done any silversmithing, um, you'll know that you have to uh, repeatedly so it just got to that dull red and I'm just going to let it cool slowly um oh dear I'm set fire to the cable on the camera now <laughs> um if you've ever um seen a silversmith work done a silversmithing you'll see that they are heating this a uh, silver then they quench it usually in a bucket of really cold water and then they heat it again and that's to stress relieve it to make it soft or to anneal it otherwise the material would just become very hard and crack now it's slightly different here because what we want to do is we want to make this bit of brass as malleable i think that's the right one i always get my malleability and my ductility mixed up but as malleable as possible so we can squidge it down and rivet it uh, we're not bothered about the mechanical strength per se it's going to be fine so we could, it's a small piece of material, so it'll have cooled down-ish. Uh, we could put it in cold water or we could leave it to cool naturally. So, um, right, let's reassemble. Maybe hopefully for the final time. Now, in this particular instance, um, I mentioned it last week, but really important, there's a gap here. You can see I've filed it away underneath. There must be a gap between the spring and the frame, otherwise it won't pro work properly. It'll just end up rubbing. Right. So let's just pop that in there. And we need to then... So that all fits together quite smartly on its own. Pretty happy with that. I, uh, I would, for sake of paranoia, just check that it actually works again, but... I'm pretty sure that it, that it works when you checked a few minutes ago. Um, so we're going to rivet this on. So riveting is just deforming plastic deformation. So moving that material so it doesn't go uh, back. It makes a permanent fixture. And again, you can see on this side, that one actually has a little bit of a domed head. I could do it like that. And again, let's just have a quick chat about um, tools and things, because there are many ways you can rivet this. You can do it in a very inexpensive kind of way. Uh, but I will just point out uh, this device here, um, which some of you will be familiar with. This is a, a 
thing called the watchmakers staking tool. And it's one of those tools that you probably buy at a kind of intermediate level of practice. You can buy them secondhand as this one is quite grungy uh, on the internet. And yeah, it's going to cost you, um, I would say between about 50 and 500 pounds, depending on how um, smart a version you, you want. Um, it's an investment for a lifetime. And the great thing before beginners are put off and go screaming and running for the hills about buying all these tools, the really cool thing about buying these tools is these things brand new are an absolute fortune like the lathe that we saw. So if you buy one on an internet auction site and the beauty of being a member of a group like this or the Facebook group, and there are many others, of course, is that you'll get lots of often conflicting advice about this stuff. Um, but you keep the thing, and if it doesn't work out for you, if you don't get on with clock repair in the medium term, you can sell it. And if you look after the stuff, the chances are, in fact, with watchmakers' lives over the last five years, they've gone up a lot in value, but certainly they're not going to um, crash and burn. So things like the pliers that you'll buy will be just useful around the house, and things, specialist tools like this, you might spend, I don't know, uh, Sell us in the live chat. Who was the last person to buy a staking set who bought a secondhand one? And how much did they pay for it? That would be a nice little question. So we can rivet our, um, you can see here, I've got a, a stump here, a stake, hardened steel, which goes in there. And I've got a punch, which has got a flat end. So I could, I'm not going to, I think it'll work could just put that in there and put that on there and rivet it down. That would be super easy. Um, but that might put people off because they might say, I need these specialist tools, therefore I'm not going to get started. So I'm just going to do it with a more straightforward method and that's to use um, looking around for all this stuff. Um, use a vice, just a any old um, engineering vice will do that you buy down the uh, hardware shooting store or again, secondhand on internet auction site. The blue one that you've just out of shot here that I would use maybe cost 30 pounds. But again, like the most incredibly useful bit of kit once you've got it, because uh, you'll wonder how you managed to live without it. Um, I don't think that's going to help us here, a split stake. I think um, what a split stake is, is a device like this, which you can see is where you want to pass something through. I mean, I suppose you could, if you wanted like a domed one there, you could, you could uh, cut that away to make it domed. In fact, if you really wanted to do it super smart, you'd make a convex um, shape in the end of a bit of steel to actually dome the rivet over. And what I'm going to use is um, something I picked up at a car boot sale, and it's a little double-ended, I think this is a, a jeweler's or silversmithing uh, kind of anvil thing. Again, just something that was kicking around and... Uh, £150. Right. Depending on okay. So there, there's a thanks, Ian. So staking set 70 to £150. Um, and you've got a tool that you'll use. We probably use it every second week uh, on these, um, these videos. Uh, I guess people who are repairing, um, they use it every day. It's such a useful bit of kit. Uh, but again, if things don't work out, stick it back on eBay or something, and you'll probably kind of get your money back. June says it's John's, as in John's Vice. Is that a Scandinavian brand? John's. John's, yeah, it's, pre it's pronounced as a Y, of course. It actually, it's a really long story, but it's actually one of those silent words, really. You know, if you're local dialect, it's kind of like more of an expression than an actual word. Sorry. That's just to, uh, just to embarrass Team Open Clock Club. Anyway. It's not John's. Yeah, apparently this vice, uh, it's, it's controversial. Right, so see, I've got my uh, stake here. There's actually a stake, a little stake thing on the back of the vice there that I might be able to use. Uh, so let's just pop that on there. Check that it's actually. So 
for parting the rivet. Moderately embarrassing if it doesn't work. I'm gonna check that that's actually working. Yeah, and because it was a reasonably good fit in the first place, the rivet, it really doesn't take much. Um, regrettably, you know, we hear quite a lot about banging and whacking and all that kind of stuff. It's just really usually not necessary. Um, uh, in fact, if you start doing that and you start really whacking something, then there's probably a good opportunity to stop and think uh, about what you're doing. Right, okay, so just a little bit more. I'm pushing down on the plate. Oh, by the way, I, I left it towards the, the end to say this, um, but I normally always wear uh, these disposable gloves when I'm handling clocks. In fact, I always wear them when I'm in my own practice. I just can't really hear because of uh, operating the camera and the computer and things. It's too much of a faff. So, um, but anyway. So my hammer, if you look at it, has got a slightly convex face, so ideal for doing this. And as much as I'm really not a fan of polishing clocks, this is something that should uh, or could be polished, the face of the hammer. So that's kind of quite useful. Don't know what kind of hammer it is. Oh, it's a uh, White House Atlas. Oh, we've been to this before, haven't we? They stopped making them in 1953 or something. But again, car boot find, find probably. <laughs> Right, so the moment of truth. Let's just have a reassemble. There we go. So it's done. So you might think, well, I could have just bought one and I've got nothing against buying these components. I'm not sure though if, I mean, obviously we've done this over two or three weeks because we've been making a demonstration of it, but actually by the time you go online and you have to buy six of them together and you pay postage and you wait, you might have just made one in an hour, maybe something like that. So I think that's quite uh, satisfying. The last thing I would say, if I've got any, I have got a bit of oil there, oil there is that um, obviously we're not putting this clock together at the moment, but just to demonstrate oiling a clock, because that's one of the big questions from beginners, how do you oil a clock? And um, without joking about it too much, what you don't do is to um, spray oil inside the back. I mean, that's not going to kill the thing in the short term, but it's not going to help uh, the clock because the gears of a clock, so the uh, the wheel teeth and the pinion leaves, so that where the gears intermesh, are actually kind of, well, they're not exactly designed to run dry, but they don't have any oil on them. So if you've got an heirloom up in the loft and you're thinking maybe this series of events is some way that you can get your clock running, what I would say is it's not gonna be the end of the world, but please don't spray oil inside the back. Most, a lot of people do spray WD-40 in, which I don't think is even oil in the first place, but, and I'll just demonstrate uh, not exactly why, but more the amount of oil that you do put on the bearings. So this is all a bit grimy at the moment, but um, see my oiler, that's the amount of oil that we put on. It's like a tiny, amount and so we put a bit there bit where the click touches the spring a bit there where the click touches the ratchet and another little bit there where the click and the uh, rivet posts interact okay so uh it's taken a while but we've done the thing and we've made our spring out of a bit of brass so hope that was 
of use, please share, um, is that say 55? Please share your um, uh, projects, of course, on Facebook. Right, in the last five minutes, we're going to, um, everybody's going to grow and, and disappear off to the ice cream shop. Um, we, two weeks ago, one of the big questions that we get asked the whole time is I bought a clock from the internet and the winding key's missing. How do I know what size? We had that today, didn't we? Open Clock Club had that. How do you know what size key? And the answer is you need a key that fits the square. So the, the winding square here any old key won't do the job because of that thing we talked about before, the two squares being sloppy. They should be a good fit. Otherwise, you'll end up damaging this and maybe damaging your fingers and so on as well. So you do need to measure this with um, either a micrometer or a vernier type uh, digital device. Like, show you this kind of thing. So one of these uh, digital caliper is again, a really good investment. Um, again, I'm slightly reluctant with all these tools because I don't want to put people off, but anyway. Um, and the second question is, my clock I got on eBay doesn't have a pendulum. How long does the pendulum need to be? So we run through some math. Uh, math is absolutely not my thing, um, but uh, we run through some math on how you figure out how long the pendulum should be. And hopefully that was, it was quite useful because people actually were doing that project at the same time. So I thought in this last few minutes that we've got, there is only a few minutes, we would just um, give you some homework because I know how you all love a bit of homework. And that is to look at the math of a striking uh, train in the clock. So we looked at our going train. Uh, now the math is to look at a striking train. Mark uh, to Coiler, to Keel, um, on uh, Facebook, sent an Excel spreadsheet. Every clock he repairs, he does a train count. So he, he counts up the number of teeth and leaves on the pinions. So he's got a record for future. Now you might be thinking, well, why the heck, Matthew, is this ever going to be of any use to me? And the answer is, if I could find the parts that I've lost, um, the answer is because when you get a clock like this, and this is, just zoom out a wee bit, this is um, a 19th or 18th century English 30-hour duration long case clock. So actually kind of, um, at least in the UK, quite a now have inexpensive clock, uh, crazily, which is really um, bonkers. Um, often uh, this component here is missing. And this one is actually pinned on this. If you can see there, there's a cross pin through it, but often they're loose and they're trapped underneath here. So when you take this component off the count wheel, let's not get into too much terminology, this gets lost. So you've got to figure out how many leaves or how many teeth it's got on that uh, pinion. So a bit of, um, yeah, your homework is to find a striking train. Uh, if you don't, if you're not, competent with maths as I'm not, and then do a train count and then go, right, I get it now. I understand why they've put these numbers on. So two things I want to talk about, a little bit of overrunning on time, I'm sorry about that, is we're going to look at the relationship between um, this component here called the count wheel, which I'll show you one in a minute, this component called the pinion of report, and this component here, which has got pins sticking out the side, the great wheel. And it's a great wheel that lifts the hammer. That strikes the bell. OK, so there's a fixed relationship between those things. Just to explain, here's one that I Right. I don't know what the prize is. Uh, maybe we don't actually have a prize at the moment, but just the um, the knowledge that you are such great students. Here is, uh, again, for beginners, please try not to be uh, put off by it. Oh, interesting. There's always something like really cool when you take a clock apart. We we're talking before about wear on components. Probably it's seven o'clock now, so some people might have to go. Um, you can see here these marks are punch marks. So somebody's 
tried to close up this bearing for some reason. Can't imagine it was that warm. But anyway, but on the other side, lots of really, really cool things here. One is it's a casting, not being machined from the casting with some work hardening. See those hammer marks? And two, this wheel has got notches in the edge. So this counts the number of blows of the hammer. It's got two, one doesn't exist. It's got two, three, four, five, six. So for a 12 hour period, first worst person to get it gets an enormous, I'm sure somebody's answered the question already, uh, enormous sense of satisfaction. Uh, how many stations are on this uh, wheel? Not how many teeth, but how many stations are on the wheel? If you add up one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus 12. Um, because if you think about it, this thing is counting the number of blows. I'm waiting for the answers to come in. <laughs> the number of blows. And these pins here are lifting the hammer. Um, so there must be a fixed relationship between the number of stations here and the number of pins on here. 78. 78. Well done, Chris. Chris has got that lovely uh, feel good factor, feel good feeling today, 78 or 90 if it's a clock that strikes a half hours as well. We'll go into that at another time. So these two components are geared together. In this case, this one is driving this. So you've got a pinion driving a wheel, which is kind of quite unusual. Saw this on the video. Uh, you can also see here that um, the teeth are really leaning over from when the wheel was cut. That's a crazy amount. So the cutter wasn't on centre, but anyway. So if we count up um, the number of leaves on here, there are 12. I counted them before. And there are 72 teeth on this wheel. So that gives us a six to one. Is that right, uh, ratio? Uh, we need somebody to, to nod. So 12 to 72 is a six to one ratio. I don't know whether anybody's nodding there, are they? No. Here's Ashish says, what are stations? And Bulky's nodding. Right, okay. So um, we've got a pinion here of 12 and um, a wheel of 72. So that's uh, a one to six ratio. It's the ratios that are important. And there's something I don't really understand about this. Um, but to answer uh, Debashish's question, what are stations? If you think of um, any uh, count, let's, let's stick with the count wheel striking clock, but striking clock, all it means is the place at which the striking train stops. So the number of opportunities for the striking train to stop. So in a 12 hour period on this clock, it's gonna strike 78 times, one plus two plus three. If it was a half hour striking clock, it would strike 90 times. Um, if it's grand sonnery, I think in John Taylor's uh, book, um, if anybody know that book, he maps out all the striking stations for his clock, some crazy grand sonnery things that strike thousands of times a day. But the station, if you think of it, if, if, I think it comes from like train stopping at a station. It's just the number of places potentially that the striking train can stop. So this is a uh, six to one ratio, one to six ratio, six to one ratio. Um, but if we look at this, which is slightly confusing for me, my wide angle lens, it's got 72 teeth on it, but it's got 78 stations. So the very, very last math question for you today, if this has got 78 stations on here, how many pins are on the back of this pinwheel here? Remember they're fixed in a six to one ratio. So if you've got 78, Divided by six, there must be 13 pins on here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. There are 13 pins on here. Now, my question to you, again, second bit of homework and extension exercise is, just can't really zoom out anymore, is why they don't put 78 teeth on and 13 leaves on the pinion. I've got a bit of an idea about that, and it's to do with 
making or dividing the opinion. But uh, if anybody's got any ideas about that, that would be really, really cool. So your homework this next week is to go through a striking train clock, make a train count, and figure out all the ratio relationships between the different wheels. And we've got something normally interesting to talk about with the uh, Enfield single train uh, strike, Enfield striking train as well. And that's to do with the relationship between the warning wheel and the fly, why they've done it like that. And I think I've got an idea, but have a think on about this. Um, I'll put this on Facebook so you can find out the numbers if you haven't had a chance to write them down and put your homework up there. So um, again, slightly squirming still, but big apologies for those people who have joined us tonight as beginners, uh, where I said we were doing our York Festival of Ideas. Hopefully this has been a, a bit of a bonus and hopefully not too a scary an introduction. And uh, next week, I absolutely promise we will be starting with our um, single train clock, asking those questions. And thanks again to Vashish for the questions. Is it realistic that I can repair a clock if I have no tools, I've got no particular practical background? How do I go about that? How do I clean it? How do I oil it? And how do I get the thing running? So that is what we're going to talk about. It's going to be a slightly longer session next week. It's going to be 90 minutes. I would run over a bit today, which uh, I apologize for. And then the following week, uh, depending on what happens next week, of course, uh, hopefully I have lots of new members to our Open Clock Club. Remember, those people who are interested, we've got the Facebook group and we've got a live stream on Thursday night at six o'clock British summertime where we're repairing a long case clock. So hope to see you next week. Big thank you to Team Open Clock Club for doing all the live stream. Sorry, for those people who turned up for the York Festival of Ideas. It's next week, my fault. Uh, I'll see you then. Okay, bye for now. I'll leave the thing on for a few minutes so you can all say goodbye. Thanks very much. <laughs>